So if you don't know anything about Jennifer Bourne, <gasps> what did I just do? I'm pretty sure. Oh, yeah, continue to do. I'm pretty sure that I can get you to hate her in just a few seconds. Okay. She took Krispy Kreme donuts, <laughs> put it in a waffle iron, and made Krispy Kreme waffles. Oh, wow. And if you've never had Krispy Kreme waffles, that in and of itself is enough reason to hate her. <laughs> oh wait. <laughs> She's a gifted and talented artist and designer. If you've ever tried to make something look good, scrapped it up, thrown it away, tried it again, scrapped it up, thrown it away, over and over, her stuff looks good on the first try. Yes. Yeah. And she had that crispy cream waffle. We're starting We're starting to layer it up here, folks. There's two days. Turns out she's also made a million bucks. What? What's up with that? At this point, there's not much more to say except that if she wasn't as talented and as gifted as she was, if she's not as great a presenter as she is, if she wasn't an amazing di designer willing to share her insights, then you could just stick with the whole, yeah, I hate Jennifer Bourne, but it turns out, <laughs> it turns out she is gifted, talented, amazing, and most importantly, willing to share her insights consistently on her blog at Born Creative and at work camps like this. So would you please, with a large round of applause, welcome with me, Jennifer Bourne. I need to bring Chris everywhere I go. <laughs> that would be amazing. So we're starting with kind of how this talk came to be. Uh, in July, our company, Born Creative, will be officially 10 years old. Um, thanks, woo! -hoo. So uh, we're pretty excited about that. And I own my company with my husband. I do all the design, he does all the dev. He's sitting right over there, woo! -hoo. And Brian likes to look at the money stuff, which I don't do. So he's looking at data. And we're kind of looking at how things have gone in the last 10 years. And we're looking at where we made good decisions, where we made bad decisions, what was profitable, what wasn't profitable, and kind of where we wanted to continue our focus. And the caveat here is this data is kind of a sort of data, because for the first several years we were in business, we did everything in an Excel spreadsheet with income, like billing, and, and it was simple, and we have no data for that, except maybe our tax returns. So we're looking at a subset of as long as we've been in QuickBooks Online, which is a portion of those of those 10 years, save the first several. Um, what he came into my office while I was working, taps me on the shoulder because my headphones are at like a hundred, like the hundred percent noise, right? And I can't hear anything, and says, "We've got to talk." Now, the primary focus of our business is custom WordPress design and development. If you ask us what we do, it's about 90 percent of our work. But we're a full service agency because I don't do dev and my background's in design. So we also do ancillary services. And he came in and he said, I have a figure for you, a million dollars. And I said, well, it's, ten, we've been, it's been 10 years. Like I kind of get that, right? But he says, take out all websites, all website work in design alone, in only the side stuff that we upsell to our design clients. We hit that million dollars in design. And some people say, big deal. If you were serving enterprise, big deal. That's not that much. But other people say, yay, that's so much money, right? And it's just two of us. Granted, there's expenses and all that other kind of stuff mixed in there. But most of the projects that made up that dollar figure were all done at $125 to $3,000. Right? See? You're thinking, what the hell? Are you kidding me? Most of those projects at $125 to $3,000 in those 10 years were done. We used no subcontractors. I did all of it. Right? So, 
<laughs> Again, you're thinking, oh, what the hell? Some people are shocked. You're wondering, how on earth did you do this? And my answer is lots of crying <laughs> and no sleep. And I was kind of bitchy. And some people have some pity for that. But the good thing is I really, really like what I do. <coughs> and over time, I got really good at selling design. I got really good at <coughs> talking to clients about why they need me, but without actually selling. Imagine what your life is like if you don't have to pitch, if you don't have to make the hard sell, if you don't actually have to ask and go after and seek and find and beg for the money. And it just comes. <coughs> the focus of this talk while our project minimums are much different today and I have a much better life today than I did for the majority of those 10 years. The majority of all the talk that we're gonna focus on today is from the time doing those smaller projects of serving that entrepreneur and small business client of looking at people who have limited budgets but they really wanna create something amazing. <coughs> now design is subjective and it's emotional. Everyone has an opinion. Everybody's idea of what is good design is different. Some people will look at something and say, this is amazing. And I can look at something and say, that is amazing. We're both right. We just have a different background. We have a different perspective on things. We're looking at things in a different way. What some people think is simple is, simple is really complicated. What some people think is really complicated is simple. <clears throat> to sell design, you first have to understand what your clients desire. You have to understand what the people who are coming to you to inquire about your services, what they really, really want. And it's often not what you think. The first is they just want to look better than their they want to look better than their competitors. They want to look better because oftentimes they're sitting at home thinking, why them and not me? I'm just as good. They are also, they want to look bigger. They want to look more expensive because they want to charge higher rates or they want to make more money. They also want to be able to close sales faster. They're contacting you about design, even if it is websites, if it's just graphic design, they're contacting you because they need to appear more professional. They need to communicate their message. And ultimately it's because they want to make money. Otherwise, why are they investing with you, right? Everything comes back down to making money. They also want to create new opportunities for themselves, maybe to get invited to speak or to get invited to be part of something that they're not yet. And they don't want to have to do a ton more work. They're hoping you can help make their journey easier. You're helping you can help them achieve their goals easier. And they want to be listened to. They want someone to listen to what they need. They want someone to listen to what their challenges are and help them figure out how to get to their goal, how to get past their challenge, to overcome that, and to show them how to do so. You also need to understand how they're making decisions when you're talking about design because your potential clients and you often are talking about very different things, even if you're using the same terminology. When you're making decisions, <coughs> Decisions are often made from emotional, an emotional perspective. People make decisions based on how they feel, right? People buy from people they trust. They're buying based on how they feel. They're buying from their heart. They're making that decision. These emotions come from their conversation with you. It comes from their experience with you. Now, once they decide, I really like you, I like what you have to say, this is really interesting, I'm, I want to get started, that decision is justified with their brain. It's justified with their head. That's where logic comes in and that's where your contract comes in. So you're selling them in the emotional part of the conversation. You're tapping on what their problem is and how you're going to help them over achieve it, you know, achieve it. But you're following that up with clear logic and language that supports what you're saying. That they can highlight and check off and make them feel really good about spending their money because it's clear in writing. <clears throat> now let's talk about how you apply these things in that sales process. So the first thing is to stop talking about you, right? Your sales call with your clients really has nothing to do with you talking about yourself. 
the biggest mistake that we see a lot of designers make in those sales calls is they immediately launch into a pitch. Let me tell you about my business. Let me tell you about what I can do. Let me tell you about my experience and how I can help. And all of a sudden you've been on the phone for 15 minutes and they've just been listening. And that's not a conversation and it doesn't feel really good because again, if we go back, they're wanting someone to listen, to understand them, to say, I know how you feel and I can help you. And talking about yourself doesn't achieve that. So you wanna really focus on listening to your clients. On that initial sales call, you're skipping all the trivial details. I talk to a lot of designers who are like, you know, I'm having a hard time converting these sales and we're talking and I'm asking them about, you know, their colors and their type and this and that. And we say, wait a second, back it up, uh, right? These things don't matter. I don't care what your logo looks like. I don't care what your colors are. I don't care what typefaces that you like. I don't even care what websites you like. I don't care about any of those things until you've paid me money because they don't matter, right? They don't matter. Whether someone wants something blue or something orange doesn't matter in how much money you're going to charge them for what you're doing. None of those little trivial things matter and you're taking up really important time in your conversation where you could be building a relationship. You could be getting to know them and building trust. So those details also leads to the problem of underselling and undercharging. It leads to a commoditization of design. Because when you're talking about all those trivial things like color and type and all of those things that are just details, those are what they're doing that is That's what especially talking about. Where you start to get into being able to charge a higher rate is when you're talking about strategy and you're listening and figuring out what they need and you're starting to dig in deeper. You're peeling back that onion to get to the root of the problem. But oftentimes what they think the problem is is not really the problem. So when you focus on these trivial details, it's devalu devaluing your process and it's getting in the way of you getting the information that you need to provide an accurate amount of an accurate estimate an accurate proposal so you're not going to have to go back then and say well I didn't really charge you right I need to charge you more which you should not do but you don't have to do those kinds of things so what you have to remember in your sales conversation even though you're selling design you're not really tangible design they see portfolio they talk to you they know you can do the work you're the experience they're gonna have with you. You're selling your expertise, your consulting, your interaction, how they're gonna feel while they work with you. When you're on the phone, when you're in that sales conversation, when you're meeting with someone, you wanna ask them a lot of questions. Open-ended questions. Things like, first, tell me about your business. I wanna know if you're not crazy. <laughs> And that'll give me a good answer, depending on how you talk about what it is that you do, right? I'm also going to ask, why do you need this project done? Why are you even contacting me? What I'm really asking is, why is this important to you? Because I'm going to write that down, and then later, if you have any objections, I'm going to come back to why that was important to you. And I'm going to use that in closing my sales conversation. You're telling me why this is so important, so later I'm gonna remind you why it's so important. And I'm gonna ask, how is not having this affecting your business right now? You're contacting me to create something for you, whether it's a brand or a brochure, whether it's a website, whatever it is, they're contacting you to create something for them that doesn't yet exist or exists and is just crappy. And asking them, how is not having this done affecting your business will give you some great insights. And again, information you can reuse later. When you're on the phone with someone, you say, how is not having this affecting your business? And they're saying, I can't sell my program or my product because I don't have any sales material. I don't have a website to send it to. I don't have a leave behind piece that I can give them in my meetings. So I'm not going on sales calls yet, or I'm not selling my program yet. You can follow that up with questions like, wow, if you had this done, how many sales conversations do you think you could have a month? 
and they could say 10. You said, wow, how much is each one of those sales worth? A hundred bucks? A thousand dollars? Let's say a thousand dollars. So by not having this done, you're potentially missing out on $10,000 a month. You're potentially losing $120,000 in revenue by not having this done. Is that what you're telling me? Hmm. So me charging you 10 grand really doesn't seem that big of a deal in the long run, right? By, under, by asking the right questions up front, you're getting into the details of what's really important to them, what their challenges are, why this is important and the difference that it can make in their business and in their life. And when you can tap into those emotions, parting with their money to make that happen isn't that big of a deal for them. And then again, what is gonna, what is gonna change for you when this is done? When we finish this and it's successful, when you make all those sales, let's say you only make half the sales you're gonna make, 60 grand. What kind of difference is that gonna make in your business an extra 60 grand? What are you gonna be able to do? And if you can do that in your business, how's that gonna affect your family life or your personal time? Are you gonna be able to take that vacation you've never been able to take? Man, this design sounds like a really good investment, right? So you're removing a lot of those kind of those objections early on without really doing any selling. You're simply asking questions and you're showing them you're interested and that you care and that you're listening. And a lot of people haven't had that before. So it feels really good to have someone show how much they care. Each time they're giving you a question, you're again confirming that understanding. You're reminding them you're listening. You're showing them, I get it. I am right there with you. Because later you're going to say, we can do this together. Now, once you've got them, once you guys have figured out, you know, this is something that we can do. We can help you with this. Then you're going to look at some more details. You're looking at constraints. Is there a budget you're working in? Is there timelines you're working against? Do you already have content done? Are we going to be waiting for that? Do you have samples of what you like so we can make sure that we're on the same page? That what I'm thinking here and what you're thinking here are the same thing. Looking at who the stakeholders or the decision makers are. Are you the person making the decision? Or are you kind of the person making the decision? And there are other people that are influencing this decision or making the decision. And then again, what are the specific requirements? Are there specific requirements we have to stay within? The worst thing you can do is not ask the right questions up front for a print piece, design something amazing, and then find out they don't have the budget to print it the way that you designed it. Horrible lesson to learn. Been there, done that. So, once you've had this conversation with them, they know that you get it. You can confirm that this is really great news. I say, well, I've got great news. This is going to be a great fit. And I'm excited about this project. I am excited about the opportunity to possibly do this project with you. People want to work with someone who's just as excited about their business as they are. They want to work with someone who's going to like working on what they're working on. So you want to talk about, you know, communicate that you're just as excited. You're looking forward to getting started. Maybe you even already have some ideas. Oftentimes, by the time I get off this first phone call, I already know exactly what we're going to do. So I can give them kind of a hint. I've already got some ideas. Here's one thing maybe that I was thinking. And by then, it's like hook, line, sinker, you're done. They're really excited. And then you want to follow up. You've confirmed. We're a great fit. I, you feel it, I feel it. It's like we're meant to be, right? I'm excited about this project. I know you're excited about this. This could add an extra 60 grand to your budget or to your bottom line. This is a big deal. Here's the investment. And then you just stop talking. Stop talking. Silence. The first person that speaks loses in all cases. You tell them how much it's going to cost, you give them the, the budget, or if it's a ballpark, whatever it is, you're going to tell them, here's what I think it's going to be, and you just be quiet. Because quiet is uncomfortable. And what the inexperienced will often do 
is they'll wait and the client will be thinking and they'll say, but you know, we could maybe do it for, and all of a sudden you're negotiating with yourself. <laughs> you're offering to lower the price or to do something cheaper or to throw in bonuses and they didn't even bulk. They haven't even said anything yet. So you're just quiet and you wait for them to talk. They're either gonna say yes, or they're gonna have some concerns. And at this point, you wanna be one step ahead. You wanna look and understand those concerns of your clients in advance. What if I don't like it? What, what if I don't like it? What happens then? That is a common question with design. The best thing you can do is share your process, how you work through revisions, how you make sure that they like the end product. What happens if they need, you know, extra? You know, walk them through that so they know what to expect. And sometimes you're just gonna have the situation you need to say, have you looked at my portfolio? Did you like what you saw? Yes, I'm confident we can create something just as good, if not better, for you. And they either trust you or they don't. So it just kind of depends on the client. People say, what if I need more revisions? What if something gets printed and there's a typo and nobody caught it? What happens? You want to answer those and set their mind at ease. Let them know how you work through things. Let them know what your policies are. Let them know if you have price changes, you know, whatever it might be. Is answer those questions, but again, with the idea that we're here as a partner. I understand what you need. I am confident we can create something amazing. If for some reason there is that issue, here's how we would handle that. And set them at ease there. Then people wanna know how much work am I actually gonna have to do? People think it's this magical thing, like they can throw some money at you and all of a sudden you're gonna like poop a golden egg and it's gonna be done. But that is just not how it works. Clients have to do work. And a lot of times they're gonna wonder how much work am I actually gonna do? How much time is this actually gonna take? They may delay a project a little bit because of that. It may end up that they need additional help or other services for you to help that you get that done. That might be an opportunity for an upsell or a referral to someone else who can help them get those things done. <coughs> and then again, the biggest objection is usually money. They really like what you have to say. Everybody wants this much work for this much money. Everybody does. But when they're asking at this point, I'm not sure it's worth it. Maybe I could find somebody cheaper. They're thinking, my friend's brother does design. Maybe he could do it, right? <laughs> and this is where those questions you asked up front come into play. This is where they become your best friend. And they say, oh, I'm not, just, I'm not quite sure on that budget. I'm going to need to talk to my partner or whatever. And you can go back and say, wow, well, you really told me that you were having this challenge and that it was a priority. Has that changed since we started talking? Well, no. Okay. And we talked about that I'm only charging you this. And we talked about how this is going to change your business for the better and could potentially put X amount of money back in your pocket, which is way more than what our time together would be. I'd really like to help you achieve those goals. I would really like to help you make that a reality in your business. But you're the only person that can make that decision. How bad do you want it? Like, do you really want it or are you just talking about how you want it? Some people you can say that to, and I have. Some people you can't. So you've got a temper kind of the person that you're talking to and figure out you know what how you can talk to them what you can share but asking really good questions up front and getting that information about what's really important to them is the best information to use to combat those objections because they're telling you up front why it is a good investment they're telling you they wouldn't have contacted you if they didn't want it now, once you both agree that this is gonna be a really great fit and you wanna move forward, then you discuss that next step. The best next step for us is to send you over a client agreement. All of what we talked about today in writing. Because I don't know about you, but when I hang up the phone, sometimes I don't remember everything that we talked about. And I like to print things out and highlight it and check it off and mark on it and make myself feel really good about it. 
So we're going to put together a detailed proposal that recaps everything that we talked about today and more. And then if you get that and you have any other questions, call me back or email me. I'm happy to have this conversation with you again, whatever you need to help you make the best decision for your business, even if that's not us. Because I don't want to work with somebody who doesn't think that we're going to be a great fit either, right? So notice here we said client agreement. Very rarely am I ever going to send an estimate to somebody who hasn't decided that it's this, they're working with us. I don't want to be one of three people that's providing an estimate for something that they're still thinking about. It takes work to put those things together. It doesn't take five minutes. I want to get to a point with the client where you know it's going to be a great fit, I know it's going to be a great fit, we're both excited to move forward, and I'm going to send you that agreement so you can make sure everything is as I say it is, and that you can sign it and get it back to us and we can get started. Mindset in the sales process matters a lot. How you go into a client call matters immensely. If you're tired, if you're crabby, if you're exhausted, if you're saying, I don't want to do this call, I have so much other work to do, it will come through in your voice. Most of the time, Brian and I both will take all of our sales calls standing up, walking around. Because when you're standing up, you speak louder, you speak with more confidence, you speak clearer, and you're not sitting at your desk distracted, possibly seeing those email things that are coming up on your screen. You're fully invested in your conversation. Also, you want to think about your clients as your partners. You're partnering on this project together. You're going to be working together to achieve a common goal. You also want to look at all of your existing clients. Selling to the client you already have or a past client who is thrilled with your work is a hundred times easier to selling to se than selling somebody new. So looking at where you can go back to old clients. If you've done a project for them in the past and maybe things have changed or there's something new, you can reach out and let them know. It's a lot, it's super easy when you build websites for people Plug new plugins come out, new things come out. She, earlier we were outside talking to uh, the app, the events app people, and we've got, uh, we've got a client who does events. They would be amazing for that. The best way to do that is to get back and email them and say, you know what, I was thinking about you this weekend when I was at WordCamp Orange County. I ran into this a sponsor, they do this. It might be something amazing for you that we should look into. What do you think? It's an easy way to upsell an existing client. Again, go back to showing them how much you care and that you're invested in that their success as well. And it's much easier to get that money. Recurring revenue like that, or recurring revenue contracts, ongoing clients, we do it in a lot of different ways, but that money has the most profit per hour because we don't have the sales conversations and the phone calls and the estimates and all of the ongoing things every time. So you're going to be more profitable from your repeat and ongoing clients or your retainer clients. And then also remembering throughout all of your that most people focus on problem solving. And once you're actually doing the work. But everything up to sitting down and doing the work, design is all about identifying the problem. That's what asking all those questions are about. They may come to you and with a problem that they but you're asking them, why is this important to you? What challenges are you having? How is this gonna change your business? You're asking them all of these questions so you can clearly understand and identify the problem you're solving because you may recommend something different than what they think they need. So it is about problem solving, but everything up until actually sitting down and doing the work is about identifying that problem. So we go back to the idea that design is subjective. That design is emotional. That design taps in to the innermost of everyone. You know when you see something that is designed well. You can feel it when you sit in the right chair. You can feel it when you get in a bed. You can feel it when you pick up a pen, when you're writing in a journal, on a computer, whatever it is. You can look at a billboard, you can look at a menu, 
You can look at a sign at Staples that has a giant typo in it as you walk in the door and know whether it's designed well or it's designed poorly. Sometimes you don't know why. You can't point out why it feels good or why it feels weird or why something just kind of seems off. But you know that something's off. When you as a designer are talking with your clients and you're working with your clients, your job is to figure out where they fall in that spectrum. Do they notice all the tiny details? What's important to them when they're looking at design? You know, when they go furniture shopping, I will sometimes ask clients who have a hard time answering my questions. They don't know kind of what they like. They're having trouble with the design part of the conversation. I will revert to furniture shopping. Do you sit in every single chair to pick one or do you order your chair online? That is going to tell somebody a lot about how you're making decisions. When you're working with design, it's making your clients comfortable. It's building trust and it's opening a line of communication where they can ask any question and be totally honest and if you send them a draft they can say I hate that and your feelings aren't hurt because design isn't personal it isn't art it isn't yours it's a solution to a problem it's a functional thing that's creating the result that your clients need So, we have time for Q&A. If you've got questions, now's the time. I'll record it for the mic. But does anyone have questions about selling design or talking about it or any of those items? With this many people in the room, then somebody has to have a question. Yes. So the question is if the client thinks you're a great fit and you don't think they're a great fit, how do you let them down gently? Sometimes I will just say, I know that you're really excited about the possibility of working with us, but I wouldn't feel right about taking your money. I wouldn't feel right about that. My goal is that you have the best possible experience. You get the best result for your money, and you enjoy the process. And I just don't think that we're gonna be the best people to give that to you. You make it about putting them first and having them get the best result. Sometimes if I know someone that I think would be a great fit or I have another resource, I always try to give them a referral so I'm not just saying, no, we're not a good fit, goodbye, good luck. Sometimes I will say, I wish you all the best I'm more than happy to answer a question if you're talking with someone and you're not quite sure and you, you need a little bit of help. Sometimes I'll say that, but other times I'll refer them to somebody else or I'll refer them to a resource where they could go learn a little bit more maybe before they contact someone else. But I'll always try to give them something. So you mentioned the client agreement and then before that you had to give a range for the Our client agreement has, is it our, oh yeah, sorry. Client agreements, do we put the, the investment, the dollar amount in our client agreements? Yes. So our client agreements are our contracts. It outlines the process, the scope of work, the terms, the payment details, what's not included. It is a marketing piece just as much as it is a contract because until the contract's signed, the sale is not made whether they said so or not. It is just as much a marketing piece. So most clients, depending on what they want, I'm able to say, it's going to be this on the phone. I know exactly how much time it's gonna take. I know what it's gonna cost. I know what our rates are. I can tell them exactly what it is. And the, the client agreement outlines that. If I'm not quite sure we have to go back, I will tell them when we're talking about the investment. I pretty much think the investment is gonna be somewhere between this and this. I'm gonna go back and if I'm on the call or Brian sometimes will say, down with Brian and talk about this a little bit because these features we're going to need to flush out but I'm going to be in agreement with the actual dollar amount but for now just know that it's going to be somewhere between X and Y and that way they know what to expect and then we have some time to talk about that and figure out the final number. So 
understanding what you can put your clients can do. What mm -hmm. your thoughts about as you're doing all the listening after this convincing them that they probably need something else other than what they thought. I'm just totally honest. So the question here <laughs> So the question here is, what if the client thinks they want one thing, you're asking them all the questions, and you know they need something different? The best thing to do is to be 100% completely honest, and I'll say, I'm hearing you. I know that this is important to you, and you think that this is the answer. But we've worked with some other people who've tried something similar, or will drop, you know, mention some experience, will bring in some kind of qualifier that's gonna support why we don't think that maybe this is gonna be the great fit. Or sometimes we'll come back and say, I know that you think this is exactly what you need, but while you were talking, I had an interesting idea and I think something different might be the answer. Are you open to some, some suggestions here? You know, are you open to having a conversation that might lead us down a little bit of a different path that I think might be a better solution? If they say no, you know they're not going to be a good fit anyway and it's time to get off the phone. If they say yes, you know that they're open to listening to you. You know that they're open to your expertise. You know this is going to be a two-way relationship. This is going to be a better client relationship. So simply asking them, letting them know you were listening. I heard everything that you said. But while you said that, I thought about something else. And oftentimes that will lead to a much more trust as well. Uh, I have on referrals people who just but it depends the larger the project typically that's not going to happen um, repeat clients things like that we almost never get on the phone they just email us tell us what they need we tell them how much it is and they call it good and we do it um, but depending on the bigger the budget the more conversations you have to have that $125 to that $3,000, $5,000 range, most of the time we close that and we call. Higher than that, the 10, the 15, those are multiple phone calls. They have more questions. It's a, it's a bigger dollar amount. Our highest contract? Brian says, no way, not telling. <laughs> Thanks. Well, the majority of all of this particular work, none of it was web related. But for all the web related work, which is the majority of our work. Uh, we do it a couple different ways. So we have some clients that they just email us every time we need something. We do it and we bill them every two weeks and they never ask how much it costs. We have others that they buy blocks of hours per month, a certain amount of hours per month, and then what they get for those hours is negotiated. We'll negotiate on, uh, for depending on the hours they buy, how fast response times are, you know, how quickly the work gets done, how quickly we respond to email, you know, all of those different things, it'll depend on how much time they're buying with us and what the work is for. But also, we don't offer ongoing maintenance services to all of our clients. No, when we launch your site live, you're done. Unless you're paying us an ongoing support fee. That's it. Launch means contract over. Um, now we'll include, you know, a warranty for a certain amount of time that if something we built breaks, but if you break something or something else is needed, that's considered support, we are more than welcome to provide that to you for a fee. But our contracts are for the build and the launch and the training. Ribbit, I can't hear you. So the question was, how do we deal with revisions? So this is the last one. Um, so how do we deal with revisions or mitigate more revisions than are in our contracts? And the key for us here is we remind a lot 
and are really open to letting them know that we'll do as many rounds of revisions for you as want. I will make a hundred rounds of revisions if you want for a fee. The only way we can give you a flat, we do all flat rate for the most part. The only way I can give you a flat rate amount is to set a certain amount of work for a certain amount of money. Included in that contract is three rounds of revisions. If you need more than that, we're more than happy to do that, but it's gonna be at an additional fee of you know X hourly rate, whatever that is. And then as we're going through that design process, we'll say, here's your first draft. Do you have revisions? We'll say, are these all the revisions right now? Because we wanna make sure that we stay on track with our contract. And they'll say, yeah. We'll send it back, here's the first round of revisions for you to review. The second, here's the second round of revisions for you to review. We only have one more left in our contract. So make sure that anyone who needs to look at it needs to look at it right now. And remember, if you do need more, we're more than happy to do that for you. Just let us know and we'll track our time. Is she amazing? Yeah.